time. I hope we have more of these. Uh, so much of what we do in cardiology is connected to what you guys do in the ER, and I think if we're going to kind of move the cardiac care that we uh, we give our patients at King's in, in the right direction, we're going to have to do more of this. So thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess my first slide is a little, shows the bias where I'm going with this. We'll work through it. Um, so this is a cardiotachoscope, and um, it was invented in 1951. It's like the first machine ever used to monitor heart rate or heart rhythm. And it was invented by these two surgeons. I think one of them was Dr. Hemmerstein, and one was Dr. Shiner. The reason why they invented it is because perioperatively, back in the day, if you wanted to know what someone's heart rate was, you had to like do a 12 lb kg. So in the middle of surgery, they'd kind of have to stop, and people would come in, and I don't know how they put leads on you, like perioperatively, but they would, and um, you'd get the data you needed. Um, so because that's so uh, such an unreasonable thing to do, these guys invented this scope, and uh, you would attach it to the patient and leave it on throughout the, the surgery. And they published this in anesthesiology in 1951 or 52. And you see in their summary they say, an alarm system is included which will signal changes in rate beyond preset limits and will warn immediately of cardiac arrest. So this is really where you start thinking of using um, kind of mechanisms and mechanics in, in modern heart, heart rates. Um, I want to start by going over two cases. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about them, and then we'll kind of revisit them later on in the talk. Uh, the first is Mrs. Kaplan. Uh, she is a 68-year-old female. She has a history of anemia and atrial fibrillation. She's on Coumadin, Aspen, and Topol. She comes to the ER with shortness of breath on exertion, um, and she's found to be anemic. Uh, she denies palpitations or syncope, notes, you know, like blood in her stools. An uh, EKG is done and shows her, her, uh, her rate is controlled at 70. Uh, and she's admitted to D4 South. So, you know, um, we, uh, we round on D4 South now, cardiology does. So I'm on D4 South this week. And um, this is a patient that I saw this week. And um, let's go to the next patient. It's Johnson. She's 78. She has a history of coronary disease with stents. She came to the uh, emergency room with syncope. Uh, her EKG just shows uh, AFib with a ventricular rate of 60. Her troponins are negative. She's also admitted to telemetry. Um, D47 is full, uh, which happens often. So she stays in the emergency room for 48 hours, awaiting <laughs> telemetry. And when patients are staying in the ER, awaiting telemetry, uh, they're still admitted under us, so we come down and we take care of them. Um, you guys do also. Um, and you know, the telemetry situation in the ER is challenging. Sometimes people who are on telemetry are really on telemetry. Sometimes they're on a, a screen in the ER, um, you know, where if you see the screen, you'll know what the rhythm is, but like if the curtain's closed, you wouldn't know. Um, so this is somebody who the team decided needs telemetry, but you know, can't go to telemetry, but is getting like quasi-telemetry, waiting for telemetry. Um, yeah, so she's on a monitor. There's no central monitoring, as you know. After 48 hours, um, when the other patient, Ms. Kaplan, with the GI bleed is discharged, Ms. Johnson goes up to D4 cell. Okay, so, um, you know, this is telemetry at, at Kings County. Um, we have, uh, this is on D4 South, it's our cardiac telemetry floor. We have a uh, teletech over here. Let's see, high drive that you just did on the arm. We have three screens. We have 32 beds, 32 cardiac tele beds at Kings County. There's someone watching these screens all the time. Um, when alarms go off, a uh, nurse will go check on the patient. Um, if uh, the tech feels like they're seeing something that needs immediate response, they'll let the house staff know. Um, and then you see over here, the alarms are printed out. Um, the tech looks at them, identifies what patients they need to go with, and puts them in the chart. Uh, this is the patient side of telemetry. Uh, you've all seen this before, but it's a box with multiple wires that are you know, taped all over the patient um, for the duration of their telemetry treatment. Okay, so why do we need to address this? So, um, Kings County ER, you guys see 125,000 patients a year, which is a lot. Um, 27,000 admissions per year to the hospital. We have 625 beds total. Uh, but we only have 32 
telemetry beds. So 5% of our beds are cardiac telemetry, which is this little piece of the pie there. And you know what that forces us to do is really look at telemetry as a limited resource, because you know what it is. Um, and uh, that being said, since it's a limited resource, the overuse of it has impact, right? Uh, and it has impact on, on all of us. It has impact on patients. It has impact on nursing, and it has impact on the hospital. All right, so you know we tend to think of telemetry as a benign thing that we order patients, but there really is a lot of impact for you as a patient if you go to the hospital and you're hooked up to that monitor for the duration of your stay, right? Um, so the first thing is a decision is made for you to go on telemetry, and that might be the right decision for you, or it might be the wrong decision for you. But either way, it's going to slow down the flow. It's going to make you wait longer for your bed in the hospital. Um, it's going to make you wait you know, longer in the emergency room. Um, uh, patients on telemetry are less mobile. It's been described in, in the literature as this wire burden. Because you're connected to this device, you don't have your normal kind of freedom of mobility. Um, it's been associated with increased risks of DVT. Patients on telemetry get out of bed less, partly because of the wires, but partly because they think they're sicker. Uh, pressure ulcers, there's psychological factors associated with being on telemetry. People really you know, listen to that alarm, they watch that alarm the whole time. They're, they're concerned when the reading is off. Uh, there's skin irritation, there's increased Foley use. Patients on, um, on telemetry are less likely to get out of bed. Uh, they sleep less, which is understandable, and there's also increased falls, again, from this wire burden. Um, and, you know, telemetry is associated with increased length of stay and increased cost. So, the cost for telemetry, which is just the cost of having that box on you, uh, is $53 a day. Um, so, if you look at our hospital where we have 32 telebeds, so 32 times 53 times 365 days a year is it's almost $700,000. That's just for tele, right? It's, it's not for, for the nursing aspect of it. It's not for anything else. It's just for that tele it's part of your treatment. Okay, and then there's the nursing implications of telemetry. So there was a study that showed that each patient on telemetry requires an extra 20 minutes of nursing time a day to manage the administrative equipment and patient care needs associated with telemetry. So patients having their um, uh, leads taken off or the alarm going off unnecessarily or changing the battery or patient, you know, calling the nurse because they're not sure if it's safe for them to get up and go to the bathroom. Um, so, um, if you look at our hospital, D4 South uh, has 32 patients throughout its telemetry. That's 640 minutes per day of nursing directly associated with telemetry maintenance. Uh, we have six nurses each shift. We have two, two shifts. There's 12 nurses a day, and 10 hours is just for tele telemetry maintenance. So you're kind of like losing a nurse in this. And I think that's important because we'll get into this soon, but if you ask physicians why they're ordering telemetry for patients, some people are, are, are following guidelines. Other people are doing it because they feel like patients get better nursing care on telemetry floors. Uh, they feel like their vital signs are going to be measured more often or you know, send my sick with patients to telemetry. Where in fact, patients on telemetry have less nursing care because so much time is spent on the monitor and taking care of the monitor rather than the patient. So I'd argue that actually your patients are getting worse nursing care on telemetry versus uh, the other parts of the hospital because of this time constraint. Uh, these are some really not funny slides, but this one is just uh, you know, trying to get to the point that sometimes the treatment is worse than the, uh, than the disease. And, uh, we want to see that. You want to see that? <laughs> I'm, I'm insecure about the funniness of them, so I'm going to get down. <laughs>
to, to see that there are guidelines for telemetry. And I'm the chief of cardiology, and, and I've been in cardiology for a long time at multiple hospitals, and we've never followed the guidelines for telemetry. You know, telemetry has always been this like gestalt thing you decide in your mind, like, yeah, this is a telemetry patient, or this isn't a telemetry patient. And, um, you know, some of those decisions are probably uh, based on really like sound cardiac thinking, and others, you know, like the nursing ratio that we talked about, you know, aren't. Um, but there are guidelines, and when I, you know, started to research how we could improve our telemetry services at King's, I went to the guidelines, and the guidelines are from 2004, uh, and uh, they haven't been revised since. Um, so the guidelines break down telemetry uh, indications into three classes. So class one is, uh, you know, you need telemetry. Uh, most, if not all, patients in that group would need it. Uh, class two is, you know, you might, you might think of telemetry, and, and class three is you don't need, you don't need telemetry, there's no benefit, and there could be harm. In addition to saying who needs telemetry and who doesn't, the AHA has said, you know, there's a duration of time that people need telemetry too, so patient X with condition Y might need telemetry for 24 hours, whereas, you know, the other patient might need telemetry for the duration of their stay. And if you put these guidelines together with the indications and the recommended time frames, you get this. And um, you guys will become more familiar with this. We'll work on it together. This is going to be a big part of how we decide who needs telemetry. Um, so basically, it's broken into three categories of people who need telemetry. Um, so, and you're going to either need telemetry for 24 hours, for 48 hours, or indefinitely. Um, and you know, what I'd like to work with you guys at achieving is starting these times uh, in the emergency room. Um, working on our telemetry system in the emergency room for those who really need it, that we can start time zero on admission, um, which will help us uh, act and treat these patients quicker. Um, and we, you know, we'll go over how this is validated. Sorry, yeah. Uh, we can't really see it in the back. I don't know if okay. you can go through Yeah, sure. But yes. So, um, for, these are um, clinical guideline based telemetry criteria. So, 24 hours would be chest pain rule at MI, um, non urgent uh, PCI intervention. So, someone comes in for an elective stent, they get stented, they should be on uh, telemetry for 24 hours. Implantation of an AICD or, or pacemaker lead, 24 hours. Uncomplicated ablations, syncope of truly unknown origin. So someone comes in, they pass out, like maybe like our other patient. Uh, that would be um, 24 hours of telemetry. Major surgery and other. Other is really um, <laughs> whatever you want it to be. <laughs> no, other is a small category of uh, it's palpitations with people of history of arrhythmia in the past. Okay. We'll, we'll work on that. Uh, 48 hours is acute MI. Uh, CHF exacerbation and cure subacute. So, if someone comes in with new CHF, they need to be on tele for 48 hours. If someone comes in with a CHF exacerbation, they need to be on tele for 48 hours. We want to know is there an ischemic part of this? Is there an arrhythmia contributing to the, the heart failure? So, that makes sense. Uh, syncope with suspected arrhythmia. So, we had, um, there's a difference here. So, 24 hours would be syncope of unknown origin. So, like, I come in, I don't have medical history, I passed out. You watch me for 24 hours. But if you have a syncope with suspected arrhythmia, like some guy who um, has a history of an MI, who's had VT in the past, who comes in with syncope, you watch her or him for longer. Um, acute stroke, thoracic surgery, complex major surgery, and then indefinite uh, would be cardiac surgery during the submission, um, wearing a life vest, or um, complex cardiac disorder. So someone coming in with like a VT storm or something. Some of these, you know, this is inpatient and ER kind of patient situations. The situations that I think you guys are going to run into <coughs> which would uh, require telemetry in the ER is uh, chest pain rule at MI, uh, syncope of truly unknown origin, uh, acute MI, CHF acute and subacute, syncope with suspected arrhythmia, stroke acute, uh, and then um, people who are coming in who have a life vest. Uh, people are coming in in like VT storm, and that's it. Okay, and then the question is, well, is this validated? Right, like it kind of feels like there's a lot of people that we're sending to tele that really think should be in tele. So, can we trust this? And um, we're going to get to that. 
So before we get to can we trust the guidelines, um, maybe we're already ordering, you know, maybe we're already doing this. Are we already doing this? Um, so um, this is a, a research letter um, from um, UCSF. It was a prospective study uh, from 2010, 2011, and they kind of uh, looked at, they approached physicians who ordered telemetry, and they're like, oh, why do you order telemetry? And um, so uh, they looked at 182 patients, and the three most common reasons were, uh, I, I question these, I think these numbers, I think we're better than this, but you know, it's UCSF. So um, GI bleed was almost 20%, Renal failure was 17%, pneumonia was 11%, and only 11% of the 182 patients admitted to telemetry at UCSF uh, had those um, guideline-based criteria. Um, and then when you ask the doctors uh, why, so why did you order these non-guideline-based um, telemetry orders, half of them said uh, to detect early clinical deterioration, which you know, on the telemetry floor, like we said, the nursing ratio is less. Uh, the vital signs are not measured any more often. Uh, the only thing you're going to pick up is a cardiac arrhythmia. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think this is valid. We can talk about it some more. And then 22% had concerns about developing arrhythmia. So, um, you know, this was like a patient who had a PE who they were afraid would develop atrial fibrillation. So that's why they put them there. Okay, but again, these are not in the guidelines. These are not reasons for the guidelines. Okay, and then um, this is a, another study um, at a 545 bed academic hospital. This was uh, one of the Hopkins hospitals. Um, so what they did there is if you wanted to order telemetry, there was a drop down bar which had those criteria on them, and you'd have to check off which of the guideline-based uh, protocols you were using. Uh, there was another box called Other. So you choose one of them, and if you thought you had a criteria which uh, kind of necessitated telemetry that wasn't there, you would type Other, okay? And then 30% of all the others were orders were, uh, were Other. So 70% of the telemetry orders, people were able to plug in their desires into the drop-down menu, and then you had 30% which were other. And this is what they were, okay? So there were dyspnea, respiratory, cha respiratory changes. Again, what, what is telemetry going to do for you then? Um, hypotension, hypertension, tachycardia. Uh, you could argue that tachycardia is a reason to put someone on telemetry, but you shouldn't know what the rhythm is, right? Like, is it sinus tach? Is it sinus tach why with the plantelli? So, you know, not clear. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities, no reason to put someone on telemetry. Um, alcohol withdrawal, GI bleeding, PE, and altered mental status. Yeah? So for electrolytes, so hypomagnesemia or, or hypermercury or things like that? No. No. And, you know, so the, the question is, is this safe, right? Like, are we going to miss things? There's some more studies up there. So, yeah, I mean, you know, theoretically, all of these um, electrolyte abnormalities could cause arrhythmia, but is putting someone on telemetry going to identify it? Is putting them on telemetry going to prevent them from developing it? Is it going to um, you know, save their life? And that's what the other studies look at. Any other questions so far? Yeah? Uh -huh. uh, I don't think we're continually placing patients on telemetry for CHF. Right. So can you discuss what patients we should be concerned about? Yeah. So anyone who has a new CHF should be on telemetry. Uh, you don't know at that point if it's uh, an ischemic etiology of the heart failure. It takes us a few days in cardiology to figure out why they have a heart failure. So is it an ischemic etiology? Um, is it an arrhythmic etiology? Do they have like a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy that we don't know about? Um, and having them on telemetry helps us decide that. It helps us decide if there's an arrhythmic origin to what's going on. It'll also help us stratify the risk for sudden cardiac death, we'll see if they're having VT or not. So that's new heart failure. Worsening heart failure is the same thing. It's like So someone comes in, they've been totally, I had a patient I admitted this morning to so telemetry for that, so they're like totally rock stable in their heart failure medication, and then two days ago they start having this exacerbation, and nothing has changed, they're not sick with any other kind of URI, they're taking all their meds, they haven't had any dietary non-compliance, so then I'm thinking, well, is there an arrhythmia going on here that we're missing? 
or is there uh, some ischemia going on that we're missing? Um, so that's why. So just as sort of the opposite example, a CHF or with a piece of a known CHF with a negative proponent and unchanged EKG, maybe missed their LASIKs or had a big salty meal, and we got a reasonable explanation for that. And I would they don't have something. Right. Yeah. Or just or how about somebody who has been developing these symptoms <laughs> over months where it's not a big change, it's just kind of very gradual increasing. I think it's reasonable. Listen, I think that if in your differential diagnosis you want to use telemetry to, and the guidelines give you room to do it because one of the categories is you know, heart failure, new, or if in your differential diagnosis you have a new arrhythmia contributing to the heart failure, then I think you should just want telemetry. Whereas on the other hand, if you, you, know, you know that the reason why their heart failure is worse is because they stopped taking their Lasix, then I would do it. Any other questions? Um, GI bleeding, I mean, it's often, you know, people with anemia and GI bleeds are often going to telemetry. Uh, they shouldn't. Uh, PE, you know, maybe you should go to the ICU. I don't know, maybe you should go to some kind of pulmonary unit. But all, all that's going to happen on, on, um, on telemetry is we're going to see if they have an arrhythmia, right? All right, so they concluded that uh, it was 30% of the time ordered for non AHA guideline indications. Most commonly for vital site abnormalities of respiratory distress, suggesting that providers use telemetry as a proxy for closer monitoring of potentially unstable patients. There's less close monitoring. Okay? The only thing that's closer monitoring is your heart rhythm. In terms of nurses checking your vitals, someone being by your bedside, it's going to happen less. Okay. This talks about utility of telemetry for non-cardiac conditions. And then, in fact, placing telemetry monitoring may lead to a false sense of identifying unstable patients while increasing length to stay alarm fatigue and you know patient risks because they're less mobile. Okay, so that being said, and you know we've talked about this, is it safe to follow those guidelines? Uh, so there are two two big studies that looked at it. Uh, this is the first. Um, so what they did is they incorporated those guidelines into their electronic ordering system. So if you wanted to order telemetry, there's a drop-down menu, and you have to click which one of those indications you're going to. Telemetry. Um, so they looked at telemetries before and after they incorporated this. So um, the EMR required physicians to check off the appropriate indication. Uh, so guideline uh, compliance improved the admission from 65% to 81%. Um, all arrhythmias incurred in patients who met guidelines for monitoring. Okay. None occurred in those who did not. So using those guidelines and those indications for telemetry, this hospital was able to show that they caught all the arrhythmias they needed to catch and they didn't miss any. And then the other question is, are patients coding you know, on the floor who we decided not to send to telemetry and they didn't have any increase in cardiac codes of people. So, so that's the issue. Okay. And then this is the largest study. Um, this was in 2014. Um, again, altering overuse of telemetry in non-ICU units by hardwiring the use of American Heart Association guidelines. So, requiring you to order telemetry and have a drop-down menu saying which one of the guidelines, uh, guideline directed indications you're going to use. So, it was done at Christina Care Health System. It's the largest provider in the Mid-Atlantic, serves all of Delaware, parts of Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey. They redesigned all their orders in their EMR. You needed to order it in your EMR. And um, cardiac temperatures were removed for non-cardiac indications, and uh, you needed to select uh, indications from the drop down list. Okay, and this is the data. Um, so on the left here, we have number of telemetry orders per week. Uh, this was before the intervention, and this is the intervention. Okay, right here. So it goes from about I don't know 1,200 to 600, so it basically halves the use of telemetry. Uh, and then over here is a total hour duration per patient of telemetry. So not only are they deciding who needs telemetry, they're deciding how long you need it on, because often what we do is we put someone on telemetry and we're like, okay, you'll be on telemetry for the duration of your stay. Uh, and their mean use of telemetry went from 60 hours to 30, so they have it. So this shows that implementing uh, the uh, guidelines into the electronic ordering system is effective. Is it safe, though? 
Um, so it was very effective. Uh, and then, importantly, um, hospital census, code blue mortality, and rapid response team activation rates were stable throughout the observation. Okay. So these are two studies that show that by implementing the guidelines, you can decrease telemetry use and not have an adverse effect on uh, patient outcome. Uh, and there's a huge savings, you know, so those are the most important parts of what we're talking about. But, um, you know, so using this hospital decreased their tele-use by 70%, assuming we can um, reduce our telemetry use by 50%, talk about saving about $350,000 a year that we can put in other areas to improve patient care. Um, any questions so far? Yeah? Uh, this is for yourself and, and maybe Dr. Xavier as well. So some of those chief uh, complaints or those diagnoses were alcohol withdrawal, GI bleed, and people, physicians were concerned about the nursing, right? Right. So is there any talk at Kings County to do <coughs> that county? Something that has maybe more nursing care than, say, the floor, mm -hmm. and not as much care as an ICU? in between, because yeah. that kind of a unit is really what people want to play right. patients, not on stuff. Right. Yeah, no, I don't know. You know, and um, in my other hospital, we had like a ICU step-down floor that was, you know, that had more kind of care. I don't, I'm not sure if it exists here. The guys, does it? It does not. So it that would not. help this issue a yeah, lot. Yeah, so that's, that's, that might be a potential solution. But in the meantime, sending them to cardiac tele is not helping them. Um, in fact, it might be hurting them, right? Because there's less nursing care, they're not getting up, they have this monitor on, they're staying in the hospital longer. Yeah? Do you have a sense of the data for us, like aside from just our experiential coming across patients and patients that are better like do we have the data for what our OTs are are going to bring it? I don't. I don't. I mean, we can look back retrospectively, and I, you know, talk soon about adopting this initiative. We'll be able to start measuring after we do, and then we can compare it. But my kind of feeling after rounding and spending time on D4 South is that we do have a lot of patients. I don't know if 70%, but we do certainly have a, a large proportion of patients who, who aren't benefiting and maybe being hurt by the Yeah? Well, there's two issues. There's the issue of physical beds in the hospital, right. and there's the issue of what the patient gets, whether they get the monitor or not. Right. So even if there weren't other beds, let's say there's a patient on D4 South who doesn't need telemetry, if we could move them, you know, take that box and put it on another patient, bring them up from the ER, um, that would be helpful. If there's, a phys if there's no physical bed for that patient to leave, I don't know. So is there a way that the so that, like, hey, these are patients who are on D4 South, not on D4 South. Yeah. Here are beds that we need. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. we don't do it systematically. We need to off Yeah. We need to make it Yeah, well. So, so, I usually, when I'm on the floors, I tell my senior when I DC tele on certain patients so that they can change it in their notes, and beds are with them that, and they can do their notes. <laughs> right. Right. So I usually call them. Yeah. I don't know if that's what's supposed to happen. But so what we'll do is we'll need to take better care on the tele boxes and know what's available, and what's what's needed. Um, you know, there's a movement in the world of telemetry, of which I'm now an expert, uh, to, to centralize the monitoring. So. Instead of having all the tele patients on one floor, you have all the tele monitors in one room. And then you can put patients anywhere in the hospital or anywhere in medicine and they have a remote tele box. So the, the boxes are wireless. Is there any reason why you can't do it? I don't know what the range is on the boxes. And you need to restructure the tele service in terms of the text and you need a room with all the, the, the you know, but there's a lot of alarm fatigue that happens and it's very hard to stare at three screens all day. The teletext and there's good data showing that with these centralized tele rooms, you really do have improvement. So I think that's kind of on the horizon for us. Yeah. 
Um, okay, let's just go back to this, then we can talk some more. So, back to our two patients. I wanted to remind you about Miss Kaplan, who was the woman who came in with anemia, right? I don't know, you know, I wouldn't have ordered lung tree for her. You know, she has shortness of breath, but it's obviously, or I tried to make it obvious with this made-up patient, that it's because she's anemic, right? Yeah, she has atrial fibrillation, but her rate is controlled, okay? So she took a tele though. Should she have been put on tele? I don't think so. No. Does anyone think she should have been put on tele? <laughs> no, she needed to step down. For the anemia? Yeah. Well, yeah. she was unstable. Or, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, she needs something. But not telemetry. But see, you, there's this notion that if someone needs to step down, they should go to telemetry. But it's not better, it's worse. Right. She'd be better off on a regular medical floor that didn't have telemetry, so the nurse could spend more time with her, so she could get out of bed. Okay. But she went up to D47. And then Ms. Johnson, who we correctly, I think, assume does need telemetry, right? She has a history of CAD. She comes in with syncope of unknown origin, right? Her troponins are nice, but who cares? So syncope of unknown origin, um, history of CAD, I worry about it's SVT, it's just a valvular issue. She should go, but she can't go because it's full, okay? Because of Mrs. Uh, Kaplan. Um, should she be put on telemetry? Yes, clearly she should. These are the guidelines, right? Not only should she be on telemetry, she should be on telemetry for 48 hours. The first 48 hours that she comes to the hospital, she needs to be monitored. But she's not, she's in the ER. She's not being monitored in the ER. I mean, she's on telemetry kind of, right? But not really. She's on that monitor. No one's really looking at it. I mean, you know. So the person who needs telly is not getting it. They're waiting in the ER. And then what happens? Miss Kaplan, yeah, Miss Kaplan leaves, and now, now she goes up for 48 hours. Right? That's what we do. We keep patients in the ER during the time they really need to be on telemetry, and they're not on telemetry. And then she goes up to the floor for 48 hours. So now we're monitoring her for 96 hours. Or we're monitoring her for 48 hours. She didn't need to be monitored. Right? And that's the problem. That's the problem. So, yeah. So why not just put a whole monitor on day one? Yes. And just assume that they're never going to get a monitor in the ER. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> so someone comes into the hospital, no, someone comes into the hospital and you decide based on the guidelines that they will benefit from monitoring. Right. Um, so you do want to put a monitor on in the ER from time zero. Yeah. But just put them on the hold the monitor because they're not going to get a bed. But the Holter monitor has been, you know, so you find the patient on the ground and then you look at the Holter monitor and they had VT like an hour ago. You need something. No, no, I mean, but, but the reality is. No, you want someone, you want, you want to monitor them so if they decompensate, you can intervene. No, I understand that, but we'll be standing there in the ER. But the, the fact is they're not going to be on the monitor. But they need to be. But they, they Well, we got to do that. They, you know, they should. Well, they have to be, right? Someone comes in with uh, indication for monitoring who's at risk for sudden cardiac death. You have to monitor them. I understand that, but we're not actually recording anything in the emergency. But we should.